right uh, welcome back everyone so we were talking about uh, optical properties of uh, uh, we under optical properties of materials so we understood bulk materials absorption how that happens so it was a slightly longish lecture but uh, i hope that it gave you the primary ideas that are essential so in this lecture i'll just take maybe 10 to 15 minutes and try to tell you i'll i'll try to introduce another topic which is optical gain okay with that my discussion on the uh, the bulk materials will be done all right so so we have seen absorption already so we have seen the valence band and the conduction band which are you know which look like this parabolic and then whenever you shine light an electron can go from the valence band into the conduction band it gets absorbed nothing new we have already done this right and we already saw that it exhibits a threshold like behavior so below a band gap eg the photon will not be this is the x axis the photon energy and y axis is absorption all right so below a certain eg it will not be absorbed right and then after the eg the absorption increases parabolically this is something that we have already seen now what happens if i consider a hypothetical scenario i'll invert the case okay i'll say that all my conduction and band conduction band is filled up and my valence band is completely empty or rather it is filled with holes so you have a scenario where you have electrons and holes like this then what happens well whenever you have an electron at higher energy and a corresponding hole it will come down recombine and emit a photon right it can emit photons okay and this process of emission of photons is you know what is called as gain for example if you take a uh, electronic device let's say a resistor you lose energy you dissipate electrical energy what if you want to amplify a signal you have to create gain how do you create a gain you create an amplifier and you supply it to a power supply the power, the the circuit draws the power from the power supply and then it amplifies the signal right similarly here if you have a material with you know you you have an external pump and somehow make sure that the electrons are actually occupying the the conduction band you are pumping the electron into the conduction band then they will come down relax back and then emit a photon again that is a photon is a signal okay this is a fundamental process that is associated with any optoelectronic device so how will the functional dependence of gain be well gain i can think of as a as an exact opposite of absorption right so i can think of this gain as sorry i should write it as gain optical gain is equal to minus absorption so whatever parabolic dependence i have for absorption i'm showing you like this in principle if you have an ideal scenario you know hypothetical scenario wherein the conduction band is completely full and the valence band is empty then i should have a perfect gain which is exactly opposite so minus h cross nu minus eg so essentially minus absorption means gain that's what we talked about even in the case of uh, lorentz model where you had n equal to, you know the complex refractive index is n plus ik right k is the absorption coefficient where the k is minus means it's gain that's what we said okay so that's what happens here so effectively if you have a gain or absorption coefficient to be negative what happens to your signal let's say you have a wave okay which is propagating in some medium if you look at the amplitude of the wave as it propagates if you have a loss and that loss is significant then amplitude will reduce over distance that is absorption process the absorption coefficient captures the the envelope of that whereas if you have gain well, that means absorption is negative then what happens is your amplitude will keep growing over time that's why we call it gain right so that gain has to be negative absorption here like this so now is it possible really to have this scenario wherein you know the absorption uh, the conduction band is completely filled with electrons and valence band is completely empty well in reality it's not going to happen okay so what is going to happen is you're going to have a, have a rela uh, realistic scenario something like this okay let's say i you know i'm uh, you know this is basically an intuitive picture i'm trying to give you okay so you have the the conduction band having some electrons okay and i have the valence band coming having some holes now i'm actually considering let's say i didn't dope a semiconductor i didn't do an n type doping if i do an n type doping i'll get something like this okay i'll have an electron conduction band with filled with some electrons and valence band completely a valence band having some holes but then here i'm not doing that i just took an intrinsic semiconductor and i just pumped it okay pumping means i use a very high energy source for example this band gap if it is like say 1.4 to ev gallium arsenide instead of 1.4 to ev i let's say pump it to ev electron photons when i do that electrons will get excited they'll go to the higher energy level higher energy state 
okay so let me consider an equilibrium situation so uh, let me say i have my equilibrium situation what happens in equilibrium let's say i'm considering a i mean okay let's do silicon silicon easier numbers the the idea holds what is the density of electrons in equilibrium roughly 10 power 10 for silicon sorry electrons is 10 power 10 holes is 10 power 10 right roughly so what i can do is i can have basically a band diagram which looks like this i have my ev and ec and then in between that i have the fermi level right this is my ef what is ef i mean i can compute right i know what is the expression for that let's say i have my what is the expression what is the gap from the ei well i mean this is kind of a trivial case but ln my n not by ni okay because in this case n not and ni are same the, the ef is at ei but if you have a slightly different doping this will change similarly ef minus ei is also going to be kt by q ln of p not by ni so again this is zero right now if you have a doped semiconductor there will be a fermi level which moves we all know that this is a equilibrium situation but suppose i do something and i create a non equilibrium situation okay how do i create a non equilibrium situation i can simply pump it by photons or i can use a you know like i showed in the first slide wherein you have a laser diode i'll inject current from the left and the right so basically i have electrons and holes in the same region right that can that can also give you similar scenario so if you have a non equilibrium situation non equilibrium means essentially you are you are not satisfying the the basic law of mass action so if you have a semiconductor we know that n not p not equal to ni square that's a law of mass action when this is not true when n not p not is not equal to ni square this is my non equilibrium so if you have such a scenario and let's say you stop the excitation then the semiconductor will go back to equilibrium that's it all right so now what happens if you shine photons in this kind of a scenario well your electrons density is going to be my n not which is my initial concentration plus let's say i'm introducing 10 power uh, you know let's say my excitation is any delta n equal to delta p equal to uh, let me say 10 power 16 or 17 per centimeter cube okay that's all of the means per, per centimeter cube by the way all the concentrations so i have my n equal to plus delta n similarly my p is going to be n not plus delta p okay what will it be it will be roughly 10 power 17 both are 10 power 17 all right so how will you represent it on a band diagram okay so i'm taking a slight detour but i hope it will you know for people who are not familiar with it it will clarify that's why i'm doing this so ec and ev when you have i can compute the fermi energies fermi levels for this but it turns out that in a non equilibrium situation you don't have a single fermi level but you have a two different fermi levels for example i can write out a fermi level for electrons which is going to be looking like this and i'll represent it by an fn and i can write out a fermi level for the holes which i can represent as f p okay fn and fp which are representing the i mean so these are not the equilibrium fermi levels that's why we'll represent them by a, what is known as quasi fermi level fn comma fp are quasi fermi levels they are not true fermi levels but they are quasi fermi levels and suppose if i remove the excitation my quasi fermi levels will go back and merge into the regular fermi level all right so what will be the expression for my quasi fermi levels i can compute this okay for example if i have uh, for n fn minus ei is going to be similar expression kt by q ln of n by ni similarly fp minus ei is going to be minus kt by q ln of p by ni okay so now both are large and that is why you see that the quasi fermi levels are you know one is closer to the conduction band one is closer to the valence band so there are two quasi fermi levels that exist okay quasi fermi levels indicate non equilibrium whenever you have a led or you know whenever you have pumping led laser whatever you have non equilibrium situation they are not equilibrium situations okay that's why it's important so okay so what well 
all this story is just to explain that when you have this sort of a pumping, there is a quasi Fermi level here, there is a quasi Fermi level here, Fn and Fp, which represents, you know, how much exactly is the distance of the Fermi level from the band edge and so on can be computed. It depends on many factors like the effective masses and so on. I just, you know, simplified the whole thing for you. Okay, this is a hand waving, you know, a simplified expression of what what quasi Fermi level is. So what? How does it go back to my discussion on the gain? Well, it turns out that if you have a perfectly, you know, material with only electrons in the valence band, nothing in the conduction band, then you have absorption. The opposite scenario, you have the gain. And in the intermediate scenario, wherein I have some electrons in the uh, conduction band and some holes in the valence band, the amount of, there can be some gain, which is possible in a range of energies. So, this represents my gain. So, you can have a scenario where there exists a gain from the band gap to Fn minus Fp. Fn minus Fp is the, it captures the amount of, you know, uh, pumping that you're doing. So, if you have Fn minus Fp is large, implies strongly out of equilibrium. I can create that. I can, let's say, pump it with 10 power 19 or 10 power 20 photons per second and I gen generate a lot of electron hole pairs. Okay, I can do that. Then I can have a gain over a larger range of wavelengths. If I don't do, then I have a gain over a smaller range of wavelengths. So, in effect, what happens is, over this range of wavelengths, you can create a gain. But beyond that, if you shine a photon, you're going to have loss. That is also intuitively reasonable, right? Because I can think of a situation where I have my uh, electron here. Let's say electrons are till here, right? Now, if I shine a photon, let's say, or rather, you know, I can have a recombination of electron with the hole here and emit a photon. But can it have a photon that is coming from here to here? No, it's not going to be happening, right? From the higher levels, it cannot come down because essentially there's no electron available at the higher level. And because of which, the there cannot be emission, all right? So now, that is why over only a certain range of values, you can have gain. And that's why I'm saying here, optical gain can be realized over a range, which is the photon energy between the band gap and the separation between the quasi-Fermi levels. All right. Now, it so happens that when we talk about the lasers, we'll see that when you nanostructure lasers, there's a lot of surface recombination. And that actually detrimentally affects their performance. And we'll have to actually find ways to improve the gain here. How do I do that? That is a topic that we have looked at recently in our group. And that's some, there are some interesting insights that we have from there. All right. So this is about the optical gain. So once you have gain, essentially you are going to have, you know, luminescence in some sense. Basically luminescence is emission of photons. Right. Lumine luminous means light. Right. Emission of light is luminescence. So let's say you have a semiconductor. And somehow you manage to, let's say, inject electrons and holes into the valence and the conduction bands, or con conversely, into the conduction and valence bands. They are going to come down and emit a photon. The first that the process which emits a photon is called as a radiative transition. Radiative transition, meaning emitting light. Transition. Okay. But uh, a semiconductor need not always emit a light or emit a photon. It can emit the energy, it can dissipate the energy in terms of heat. Okay. If you have energy dissipated as heat, you call it a non radiative transition. That is also possible. There's going to be a competing process that way. And for example, if you take silicon, the energy dissipated through the non radiative mechanism is going to be significant. Whereas if you take, let's say, gallium arsenide or indium phosphide, the, the radiative transition is significant. That's why whenever you have any light emitting device, let's say, LED or laser and so on, you'll use direct band gap semiconductors which have a higher non -radi uh, radiative uh, decay is more than the non radiative decay. All right. So if you have such a thing, what you will see is that you will have, let's say you take the material, it has this absorption which is more or less you know, parabolic with some small excitonic effect and there is this emission that's happening. Uh, sorry, absorption that's happening. Now once it absorbs, the, the electrons can actually react to the bandage and give you a photon at the bandage. And that is what you're seeing here. You see, uh, if you pump it, you have a lot of photons that are coming in. And since, uh, since this, you know, the way the electrons and holes are injected is by light, we call it photoluminescence. The PL, photoluminescence. Photoluminescence. Okay, we call it PL. So this is a very nice way of actually figuring out. 
if you uh, and then if you actually inject the electrons and holes using current we call it electroluminescence and that is what is shown essentially similar trend you can see but now there is no absorption peak just that you know inject current and then there is some amount of current 1 milliampere of current you are driving into this diode and then you are getting emission all right at that you know away in that wavelength okay so led does this no you inject current and you it's emitting light at that frequency okay and then the reason i just mentioned this is it brings me back to the original motivation <laughs> why are low dimension systems important right they are important because you can tailor these things these peaks now you see these are essentially the electroluminescence or photoluminescence okay i think this is, must be photoluminescence in this case so when you have these peaks which are photoluminescence and why are they shifting the reason they are shifting is because the the band gaps are changing okay and that's why they give you light at different colors like this and that is why since you have that fine control on the light emission properties these are very very critical all right so in the week 4 you'll actually see about plasmonic structures there also you can actually do some amount of tuning of resonances and things like that but not on this fine scale they have some other advantages but uh, nothing beats semiconductors when you look at you know light emission the quantum dots and all are amazing in terms of controlling light emission all right so uh, yeah this this brings me back to the motivation i hope i have convinced you that this is a very important area that you need to understand so in the next couple of lectures i'll talk about quantum confinement so some of you might have already studied it then the particle in a box problem so we'll introduce that and once i do that i will actually derive what are known as selection rules and then apply it to let's say how absorption spectrum looks like in a 2d material and 1d material okay that will be the essential uh, uh, plan for this rest of the week all right so i hope that you know you found it interesting and let me know if you have any questions any questions from live audience all right okay then thank you so much we'll meet you in the next lecture bye